Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science. I'm speaking with you today from my living room in my modest two-bedroom apartment. Um, I want to respond to the Premier's conversation of yesterday. Um, first of all, I'd love to talk with you from my kitchen table, but it's loaded up with papers and files because we're constantly doing reports to try and inform the public of the consequences of things like coal phase-out. And that's one of the first things that I'm kind of upset about. The Premier didn't mention last night that it will cost more than $22 billion to phase out coal for the early phase-out of coal. If we had continued with the existing federal phase-out of coal, there would have been no extra cost to the public whatsoever. But now, to transition to natural gas plants, we'll have to build eight new plants, at least, of an 800 megawatt equivalent so that that would replace the coal plants. And each of those will cost at least 1.4 billion. So that will add up to more than 11 billion dollars. We got that information from an industry expert. We also asked another industry expert about the compensation costs for early phase out and that's another 11 billion or more. So these costs would never have been borne by the public if we just continued with the federal legislation. Um, I, I don't have a teleprompter so I'm just going to read from some notes here. Uh, one of the things that the Premier said is uh, we can do this and she referred to uh, economic diversification. Um, I was a career developer with Alberta Employment and Immigration for about five years as a subcontractor and during that time I learned a lot about economic diversification uh, because I was also on the local economic development authority. Um, one of the things you need for economic diversification is you need clusters of very competent people. So you need people that run the whole gamut of an industry from the shop floor guy right up to top management. And that's what we have with the oil and gas industry in Alberta. We have that expertise and we have clusters of it. One of the theories is that you can only be competitive in certain markets if you have enough of the right people. And that's why you see things like um, Silicon Valley, where you've got a lot of the same kinds of industries all popping up. And the people who work there, they socialize together. They go for coffee. They may work for competing companies, but they all belong to professional organizations. So it creates a synergy. You get a melting pot of ideas and, and notions. And we have that here in Alberta with the oil and gas industry and the mining industry, by the way, also. Um, <clears throat> so we see that we have the Global Petroleum Show that's here almost every June. And that draws people from around the world because they know that the expertise is here. So it would be very difficult in a population of about 4 million Albertans to develop a very similar kind of successful industry through economic diversification because we simply don't have the population. Another factor is the same factor that's bothering us with um, selling our oil. We don't have access to big markets. We're quite far from markets and we're landlocked. So these are things that people shouldn't be too um, uh, excited about because it's very very difficult to develop competitive industries when you're far from world markets, you're landlocked, and you have a very small population. Um, I'm not saying that there's no economic diversification that can be done because we have already done it. I recommend everybody go on Alberta Industries site. We've got quite a few industries that are significant for a very small population and we are fairly diversified. So one of the things the Premier said is she said that we can do this. What did she mean by that? Um, one of the things that the NDP is apparently thinking over this weekend is the LEAP Manifesto. Is that what she meant, that we could do that? The LEAP Manifesto is a very utopian idea that was developed by people like Nomi Klein and others who are on the uh, eco-activist side of things. And uh, they may have these utopian dreams, but practically speaking, uh, they're very hard to accomplish, mostly because the world runs on oil. I'm not saying that because I'm an oil advocate. I could care less where our energy came from. But what I am saying is the world runs on three cubic miles of oil equivalent energy every year. 
and one of those cubic miles of oil is oil. 0 0.8 is coal, 0 0.6 is natural gas, 0 0.2 for hydro, wood, and nuclear each, and way down at the bottom is 0 0.01 for wind and solar. So when people talking about the LEAP Manifesto tell you that we can't have a national wind and hydro grid that will work by 2035, no, we can't. It's impossible. And not only that, all of those things are made using fossil fuels. Like Nomi Reskies recently came out and said, oh, you know, Prime Minister Trudeau made a faux pas by saying that we need pipelines and wind turbines. Well, no, he did not, because you cannot have a wind turbine without fossil fuels. You can't make it. You can't mine it. You can't ship it. You can't install it. You need fossil fuels. You need oil and you need coal. Coal to make things of steel and um, oil to do everything else. So let's be realistic when we're looking at what the future could hold for us as uh, people on Earth. Now she also said we can do this and mention this carbon tax as if it's going to be some form of revenue that could, um, you know, uh, underwrite these costs that we have. Well, the carbon tax is estimated to be at maybe $3 billion. Um, and in every place that it's been applied, it basically drove industry out, killed jobs, and made consumers very, very poor. It pushed lots of people into heat or eat poverty. So if you say you're going to take a carbon tax and recycle it and give support to the lowest, most vulnerable 60%, well, that's nice in theory, but in fact you're creating a 60% vulnerability. And um, it, there's also been no benefit in carbon re reductions, in reductions of, of uh, CO2 or other gases. So, you know, it's not even accomplishing its purpose. It does create more bureaucratic jobs, though. Um, now, many people may be wondering, it was reported today that CAP said that investment in Canadian energy industries is down billions of dollars and people are probably wondering why that's happening. Well, we just released a new report called Undue Influence, Markets Skewed. And in that report we look at how the UN Principles for Responsible Investment are cornering institutional investors who have trillions of dollars in investment capital and assets. And it's cornering them into actually investing in renewables and divesting from fossil fuels. So as I just explained, we need fossil fuels. We need them to the point that the um, head of the HSBC Bank, Stuart Gulliver, recently at Davos, called upon ENGOs to stop demonizing fossil fuels. Oh, those are my two cats fighting. Oh, there's, like, just a second. Let me get this guy. Come here. There you go. So anyway, he called upon um, ENGOs to stop demonizing fossil fuels because we need them, we use them, and we need to have a strong investment market. But what we found in our report is that there's kind of a billionaires club in the states mostly um, where they have these trust funds. They've avoided death taxes. You know, it's like the Rockefellers and the Oak Foundation and Oh, there's quite a few of them. Anyway, they've got billions of dollars, and they decided in 2007 that they should dethrone King Coal and that sh they should also run fossil fuel industries basically out of business. And they were on the climate thing, right? So they thought they were going to change the world by investing in renewables. Well, now what's happened is they've completely skewed the markets, and uh, they're pumping millions, hundreds of millions of dollars every year into these local ENGOs to demonize fossil fuels. So this is why markets are skewed. People like you and I, we don't understand this. We just see the news, we get the reports, and um, we don't realize that these guys who have billions of dollars, they don't care if you lose your job if you're in Hannah, Alberta, because they're flying around in their jet planning how to change the world. And this is not a conspiracy. It's right out there in the wide open. You can go online and read Design to Win. That was their document in 2007. And uh, 
it's, uh, it's kind of scary that a few people like that, probably with good intention, um, are actually destroying industry in many Western countries. So, um, based on that, I'd like to ask people who are really into climate justice, is that ethical? Is that ethical to put people out of work when climate science is, first of all, quite uncertain? Secondly, climate science is um, changing. Like since that 2007 report was written, there's been a big change. In 2013, the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the authority on climate, they issued a report saying that climate global warming had stagnated for something like 13 years, 15 years at that time. Now it's 18 years and counting. We're almost up to 19 years with no significant trend in global warming. Has it warmed in the past 100 years? Definitely has. Do we know the cause? There are many, many factors that affect climate. It's not only CO2. So these guys are still operating on the old principle that it's human caused, but now it's pretty clear that human contribution is nominal. And it's also pretty clear from the IPCC report in their technical summary that there's no looming catastrophe either. There could be problems hundreds of years from now, but not catastrophes. So anyway, thanks very much for this little fireside chat, and uh, hope you like our cat. And uh, keep reading the science. Keep doing your own critical thinking. Don't rely on slogans. Oh, is that a slogan? For Friends of Science, I'm Michelle Sterling.